everyone, and welcome back to the Pike County Judge Executive's Report. I'm Cindy Mae Johnson, your host, and as always, joining us, of course, is Pike County Judge Executive Ray Jones. You've brought Deputy Judge Executive Hickman with you today, so we've got a lot to talk about. We have a lot to catch up on since the uh, last show in December. A lot, of, a lot of things have happened, and we just want to make sure that we're uh, continuing to keep the public advised as to what's taking place in Pike County government. Uh, and, you know, between these programs, there's usually two fiscal court meetings and sometimes even a special meeting. Uh, we've had things like the uh, court meeting where we declare Pike County a Second Amendment sanctuary. Uh, this court is uh, adamantly uh, in support of the Second Amendment and oppose any gun control laws that, that impact law-abiding citizens. And we wanted to let people know where we stood. And probably the largest crowd that's ever stepped foot the largest number of people that ever stepped foot in that fiscal courtroom at one time. Yeah, was, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it either. But, it, you know, it's law-abiding citizens. And it was a, you know, peaceful meeting. A lot of people, I guess, thought because the court was controlled by, you know, by Democrats that we were anti-gun. But, you know, I'm a life member of the NRA. And, <laughs> and uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm an NRA uh, defensive pistol instructor. I've got all the pistol certifications to teach. And, U.S. concealed carry instructor, and, you know, that's sort of one of my hobbies, and a lot of people didn't know that, and I guess they thought that we would be opposed to, to standing up for those rights, but, you know, Ronnie, Jason, Brian, and myself, we all grew up around guns, I mean, uh, hunting, shooting, and, uh, you know, what's taking place in Virginia really, really is concerning, because uh, if that could happen there, it could happen here. You know, just because you are a registered Democrat, people tend to forget what our culture is like here has nothing to do with your political persuasion. Well, you know what I've always said, you know, party politics at the local level doesn't mean much. I mean, working on how you pick garbage up, or working <laughs> on county roads, those mm -hmm. aren't Republican or Democrat issues. Those are basic issues that, you know, the thing about county government that was different than when I was a state government is I can see something we're doing every day and how we're getting stuff done. And I think that's... That's what's rewarding is when we can see that we're making progress. Frankfurt, you could go down there, say, for 60 days, and at the end of the session, you're like, okay, what did we accomplish? Yeah. And um, so it's a lot more rewarding doing this. But, but this court uh, is going to continue to speak up uh, when it's necessary to protect the uh, rights and the values that, that, uh, that the people here hold dearly. And the Second Amendment uh, rights uh, are one of those issues. Can I just say, and I really don't fall on either side of that argument, I'm fairly neutral, but I have to think that even people who want some gun regulation, who want maybe some things to change, don't want the Second Amendment to go away. Well, the problem is it's a slippery slope. Once you start uh, limiting the rights of law-abiding citizens, semi-automatic sporting rifles, high-capacity magazines, those kind of things, the thing that was probably the most alarming is how, how do you create a red flag law that allows law enforcement to go out and take firearms away from law-abiding citizens before there's ever been any kind of judicial determination that they're uh, mentally unsound mm -hmm. or something along those lines? And I think that's raised a lot of concern. Uh, some of the concerns were probably not well-founded. Some of them were. Um, very few crimes in this country have been committed, you know, with assault assault weapons or high, you know high capacity magazines are not even a factor in most most crimes, and um, but yet law abiding citizens like myself, who own those types of firearms, we shouldn't be made out to be criminals, and to say okay you've got to surrender your property that you paid hard earned money for, or else you're going to be a criminal in ninety days. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is a scary proposition. And when you look at what happened in Germany, you, know, you disarm the, in the 1930s, you disarm the, the people, and then government is basically unchecked. That's a great point, and it's a good analogy to draw for it. While we're talking about, um, and we started with talking about that sanctuary, um, what do we call it? It's yeah, Second Amendment Sanctuary County. Thank you. Um, you talked about being very transparent. And one of the things that has had a lot of talk lately, it's been in the news, it's been on radio and television and in the paper, are the questions that are being raised by the county clerk. Can we talk about that budget just a little bit? We can. 
uh, it is the fiscal court's responsibility to acknowledge the budgets for the sheriff, uh, for the county court clerk, for your water district, for all your independent boards, library board, health department, uh, soil and water conservation. I'm probably forgetting some. Mm -hmm. But we have to acknowledge those, those, those budgets. And it's a check and balance. And there were some issues with the math in the first budget that the county clerk, and, and, and look, I'm a friend of the clerk. Rhonda's a good friend of mine. I like her a lot. Uh, had a good relationship with her. But in the last four years, the, the fiscal court has not subsidized the county court clerk. They did at one point in time. But at that point in time, the county was getting millions in coal severance tax every year. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're not in the same financial position we were in back when Lillian Pearl Elliott was county court clerk and the fiscal court was providing a subsidy. But even at that time, she was returning most all of that money back to the fiscal court at the end of the year. There were, uh, there was, there were some problems with the, with the math. The numbers didn't add up in the budget. We asked her to go back and look at that. She asked for a $325,000 supplement for the, for the county, from the fiscal court to the county clerk's office. Well, we do provide a subsidy to the sheriff's office of $300,000. Well, first of all, I don't believe, and I know the clerks, I've got a lot of friends that work in the clerk's office. Uh, I, I appreciate everything that they do, and it's a vital public service. But you can't equate the work that the sheriff's office does to an administrative function like the clerk or even the, the county judge. I mean, what the sheriff does is the most important role of any of the local officials because... You know, they're providing school security at all of our high schools. They're providing escorts for funerals. They're providing uh, security at every ball game outside of the Pikeville city limits. They're patrolling. They're serving subpoenas, summonses, uh, warrants. And um, you can't equate a law enforcement slash public safety function with an administrative or clerical function. And it sort of took the members of the court back when you ask for a larger supplement for the clerk's office than what the sheriff's office gets. As the fiscal court has continued to have to absorb over the years the, the loss of revenue from coal severance, you know, when I came in the state senate, the county's budget was about $60 million. This year it'll be about $34 million. Uh, at one time, the county was getting seven, eight, nine million million a year directly from the state's coal severance. This year alone, we're going to end up with about 600, maybe 650,000 if we're lucky. The county has absorbed, has had to absorb millions of dollars in losses. Over that period of time, the county workforce has gone from in, in excess of 320 employees. Yesterday, when we checked, we had 208 employees in county government. Now, sounds like a lot, right? It's all the jail staff. It's your entire road department organization. It's the landfill staff that run the landfill daily. It's your solid waste collection employees that pick up garbage for more than 20,000 residential and com commercial customers. It's the courthouse staff, your public work staff that takes care of more than 100 pieces of property, senior citizen centers, fire departments, the, you know, the fiscal court uh, on property, the, you know, the county courthouse, the hall of justice, the judicial center, if you really start thinking about 208 people to do all of that, you've got uh, 54, I think, in the jail. Of that 54. Group, 54 right. in the jail of that 208. So when you take that out, you're at 154 to take care of everything else, garbage, roads, tax collection, et cetera. Starts to make me think about peanut butter spread very thin. It's very thin, and we're doing less with more. And what we've asked the clerk to do, we help the clerk. We, we had her go back, meet with another insurance agent. By switching insurance companies, she will save approximately $80,000 over the next two years. And then when she came back to the court after we said we could not give a supplement of $325,000, because if we take three twenty five dollars out of our budget, it's got to come from senior citizens, fire departments, layoffs. I mean, we have to be able to absorb that. That wasn't budgeted. Mm-hmm. And so we said, if you'll come back, you need to revise these numbers. There were about $700,000 in errors. There was a $700,000 error in the math and in the budget. And we asked that to be corrected and come back. And then she asked for a $60,000 supplement. Well, 
if you need 60,000, why did you ask for 325,000 two weeks ago mm -hmm. or a week ago? Those were, those were questions that raised red flags for the court. So if you do have a $60,000 shortfall and you can switch insurance companies in over two years, save two thirds of that. Also, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of the fees that the clerk's office charges, deeds, mortgages, over 60 different fees, the legislature last year raised those fees. For, for instance, a will, to record a will went from $17 to $50. Uh, I'm sorry, for a deed was $17 to $50. A mortgage went from like $17.50 to $80. So there was no, uh, that wasn't factored into this budget, how much revenue that she will generate this year from those increased fees, and it would be fairly easy to look back at how many of those certain transactions that you did over the last two or three years, uh, and you could, you know, just do the do the math, get an average of how many transactions you've done, and then factor in what additional revenue. So we think that she really doesn't have a, a shortfall. If she does, the court said that we would try to address that if it's reasonable. All we're doing is asking other officials to do what we've done: take the steps necessary to save money. Because as you know, this year the fiscal court did not raise property taxes. Oh, but people think that you did. Well, I've heard it. It was I, you, on Facebook. You, you saw it on Facebook. And Facebook, as we talked before we came on, is a cancer. You can't put anything positive on Facebook without a whole bunch of people wanting to spout off negativity. And I don't know what that is. Why that people can't look. People want to look through the good to find something bad and complain. And uh, as my old boss said, uh, never criticize, condemn, or complain. And I've tried to do that. It's not always easy in this job. But, you know, when you see people go on Facebook and say, well, my property taxes went up. No, your property taxes did not go up. If, if your bill's higher, it's probably because you didn't pay your garbage bill and it's on your solid waste bill. That's what a lot of these people who were calling in saying we raised tax. We didn't raise taxes. You didn't pay your garbage bill. And it's not fair for me to pay my garbage bill and a lot of other people to pay their garbage bills. A lot of people on fixed income, a lot of people who struggle to pay those bills. And you have people who have the resources to pay them and don't. So let's just put that out there. No one had a top property tax increase in Pike County. We worked with the library board. We worked with the health department. None of the agencies raised property taxes. The city schools didn't. The county schools didn't. And I think with this economy, it's important that we try to keep our, to try to, to resist the, the, the urge to raise those taxes. It may get to the point where we have to. Um, but at this point in time, you know, I'm a property owner too. I don't want to raise property taxes. But when people went on Facebook and said, well, my property taxes went up. No, your property taxes didn't. You may not have paid your garbage bill and it may have ended up on your property tax right. bill. But your taxes didn't go up. At some point, people need to say, you know, when we have something positive happen in our community, why do we have to go on social media and make negative comments? It's not just people here that see that. It's people at other places see that. And it really does undermine everything that we're trying to do positive here and trying to turn it around because of the situation that we walked into. And we've had to make some hard decisions. Well, that leads me to something positive. And um, not all conversations about finances are positive. We've just spoken about some negatives, but the fact is, as you shared with me before we started the show, the stability, the financial stability of the county is, is okay. We went from a position where the year before I came in office, the county lost its credit rating. Uh, the county's bank had two bad audits in a row. The accountants couldn't be reconciled. The <coughs> auditors couldn't even give an opinion. <clears throat> we have fixed that. Um, we are financially stable, even though revenues are continuing to be unstable. Um, coal severance tax last year that the fiscal court budgeted 1.7 million, it came in at 1.3 million. So when we did this budget, we went back five years. We looked at every revenue line item over five years to try to get a trend analysis. And you know, the one that was shocking is coal severance tax. You go back five years, the county was getting four or five million dollars a year. So we felt if we budgeted a million dollars that it will be a conservative estimate. Well, through three quarters, we just got the third quarter of our coal severance. We are on pace to be somewhere around 350,000 or more below what we budgeted. So we're, we're looking at somewhere between 600, $650,000 a year this year. 
so we're going to be 350,000 short just on that one item. And as we go forward, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to con to, to account uh, to budget any coal severance tax revenue as we go forward because of what we're seeing. Well, people who are watching this, they have to manage the finances of their home or their business. And as you said earlier, you can't necessarily run government just like a business, but there are certain business principles that have to apply. Well, you know, the difference between business and government is we're not in business to make, the government is, doesn't exist. My law practice is in business to make money. Mm -hmm. The county government is in business to provide government services with existing revenues. And, you know, it's like people were complaining about the garbage rates when they went up last year. There's no garbage rate hike this year. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Uh, we didn't raise garbage rates this year, but you know, that's what I told somebody I said, you know, you can't pick up garbage without garbage trucks. They don't give those away. You have to be able to buy them. Mm -hmm. You have to have a place to put it called a landfill. We're going to have to spend about five and a half million over the next three years just to expand that landfill. Landfill shuts down. Your garbage has to be hauled to Ashland. Common sense tells you that you can't haul your garbage to Ashland cheaper than you can haul it to Johns Creek and dump it in your own <laughs> landfill. Because right. you're going to have to haul it and pay somebody else to take it. You're still going to have to collect it. So, you know, the decision we made when we did raise the rate was because the alternative would, you know, instead of twenty four fifty a month, it would probably be over $50 a month. And you can't haul garbage from Phelps, Pawpaw, you know, Virgie, uh, Elkhorn City to Ashland cheaper than you can haul it to Johns Creek. And we kept trying to make that point to people. Uh, we are in a position now financially where we can start replacing some of the worn out equipment. We, in the last month, have put three new uh, small garbage trucks on the road. We'll have a fourth one probably in another 30 days to replace this, what we've called the mini packers of small garbage trucks. And the, 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 what we're doing, we're going to be able to replace two uh, we'll get two of the new trucks for the price of one mini packer. They're less expensive. We think they're going to be more durable, less maintenance cost, mm -hmm. and the workers like them better. We had some concerns that the, that the employees wouldn't like them, but they seem to be. Yeah, it's, it's worked out fine. Uh, the thing that was overlooked with the mini packers were it, was that it takes a long time to compact, and really a mini packer doesn't compact. It's really just pushing the garbage kind of out of sight mm -hmm. and putting it into a storage bin. Uh, with these uh, e easy dumps, it's kind of a Coca-Cola trade name for the truck that's out there on the market. Uh, you just throw the garbage in the back, you pull a tarp over it, and you go. And a lot of time saved. It's really, it's really very simple. Well, we, saving time is saving money, it too. It is. Well, we, we added uh, uh, a uh, picker at the back that will pick up a garbage can. It's not a tipper, but it's a scissor type uh, device. So that's helping with bulk. So when we run up on chairs, uh, couches, uh, bigger things that the guys before had trouble lifting, uh, they can set that there. The scissors come around it, pick it up, and dump it into the into the bin. So. Uh, so that's better service for your customers. Much better service and much easier on the employee. Mm -hmm. uh, we lessen the risk of injury of those guys lifting and things like that. And, and you know, one of the things, it doesn't have the hydraulics that the garbage trucks have to have, less maintenance, doesn't have the power takeoff uh, requirement. And uh, we think that it'll save the county a ton of money over the next uh, several years. Um, you know, when you they'll say when you do what you've always done, you get what you always what you got, you know, yeah. same result. Um, so what we try to do is look for ways to save money and be more efficient and, and move into this uh, new type of truck is going to save money. I noticed that the contractor that does the work in coal run is, is doing the same kind of thing. So we're uh, also going to be moving to a smaller, large garbage truck. We think we can go save additional money by going, you know, if the folks out there see the bigger garbage truck, the packers, we're going to be going to a smaller packer that we're going to be able to get into more places than we can get the big trucks, which will also help uh, eliminate the need for the number of, of vehicles that we're using. All of this adds up mm -hmm. to cost savings, and that's how you're making sure we do have a stable financial picture. Well, 
In the past, it didn't seem to me that anybody looked for alternative ways to do things that might be more cost effective. Mm -hmm. And that's part of government. You know, when you do, you know, well, the reason we're doing it this way is because that was the way it was always done in the past. Well, that's not what we're doing. Uh, you know, we've done everything from looking for new insurance companies that may be cheaper. Uh, we're every way we can to save taxpayer money. We're doing it. At the same time, we're also working to improve uh, customer efficiency. One of the biggest complaints we hear about solid waste is, is a missed pickup. People call them they didn't get my garbage. Well, if you think about it. These routes are being done from memory. The truck, the drivers have to remember every house. And you think about 20,000 customers. So if you have a, a, a driver that simply makes a mistake and forgets a house that may be under the, under the road, you know, turn under the hill or, you know, somewhere that's out of sight and they mm -hmm. forget a pickup, uh, or it's a replacement driver or fill-in driver, we've got some fill-ins, floats. If somebody's on vacation, they're all sick that fills in may not be familiar with that area. So I'm gonna let Reg explain the concept that we're going to. We're putting some technology that's really inexpensive in all of our solid waste vehicles that will, we think will go a long way in, uh, in order to uh, fix this problem with missed pickups. Our, our software is trash flow. The piece to the software that had not been implemented is Teleroute. So in the Teleroute program, they have a tablet and the actual route uh, is loaded onto the tablet, line by line, stop by stop, in order. And so in the future, as we, you know, go on a given route, the guys will have that in their exact order. And if we've missed somebody, that will be added onto the tablet and then downloaded into the system, and then billing will be sent out. Uh, very efficient, um, and I think will yield uh, uh, a real positive effect to our service level. Um, it, it is extremely difficult for these guys to do it by memory. I can't imagine. Uh, now this pad also, this tablet, allows them to take pictures of uh, issues that they come upon um, and the condition of the garbage uh, and any any issues that they come up on. They can take a picture and then transmit to us to, that to us and then that picture and notes and information goes on to their account. So when folks call in to solid waste to the call center and they pull up your account, that picture will be there, all those notes will be there, uh, any pertinent information about the account will be there. So it's very exciting, very efficient, and uh, those tablets are in beta test now. They're out and we're learning how to use them and we'll be in full implementation here shortly. So that they're not out there yet, but they're coming. Well, they're 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 in the field, okay. and we're learning how to use them and how to how to make it work right. The county had probably the, the best software program for solid waste management that you can have. Mm -hmm. They just didn't use it when we came in office, and a lot of the features like this uh, Teleroute uh, component, they didn't even look at using it, and. Uh, you know, the billing applications in that, the route building to try to make your routes more efficient, mm -hmm. weren't being used. So when Reggie uh, and I came in office, one of the first things, I, he's probably had a dozen or more uh, conference calls with the software developer, just helping us learn to implement it. What can we do to help save money, to make things more efficient? One of the best parts about the tablets will be there's a little icon. You know, if you're driving, say you're driving up Long Fork or Virgie, when you start at the mouth of the holler, and you're going up every place that there is a registered customer, there'll be an icon. You pick the garbage up, all you have to do is click the button to show you picked it up. If there's a house that's, you know, that you, you know that may not be visible or whatever, um, you know, it'll show you where there, that icon is. So if you miss something, you'll know it. The flip side of that is since January, we knew when we came in office that because of the lack of attention to detail, there were a lot of people using our garbage service in this county that weren't paying a bill. And there were a lot of people who owed bills that weren't being forced to pay for political reasons. You may have a political connection where you owe a big garbage bill, they just write it off. And that happened, didn't it? It did, yeah. You know, and it's not fair that some people 
are able to use political favors and go have their garbage bill completely wrote off. Well, that's no different than getting a load of gravel, is it? Well, it's no different. It's, it's the it's same just, thing. To me, it's just as illegal to do that. Yes. Uh, but it was being done. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, what we did with these tablets, what we know with the tablets, since January, we've identified over 700 people that are 700 customers that were not paying a bill that were putting their garbage out. The county's picking it up hauling it to Johns Creek to the landfill, not getting a penny out of it. Those people are now paying. They now have bills. And the thing about the tablets is, you know, if they're running a the route and somebody's got garbage sitting out and there's not on that, that route list, then they'll be able to flag it, take a picture of it, get the address, and send it back to the office so we can follow up and make sure these people are registered customers. And I think that's important. I think it's important that people... There's a lot of people that don't have faith in county government for a lot of good reasons. But I think if people realize that no matter who you are, what political party you're in, how rich or how poor, that you're going to be treated fairly and the same as everybody else, um, then I think that's important. Well, I know I pay my garbage bill, so it bothers me to think that, they're, that my neighbor might not. And it's only fair. Well, if you have some people that pay and some don't, that's why you see rates have to go up. Right. So if everybody pays, that's one way of, to, to control costs. And those bills have been sent out. Well, um, let's talk about how the bills go out. They used to, I mean, I can remember we used to get one per year, right? Right. One bill per year. Yep. Well, we no longer do that. Um, we're billing quarterly. Uh, that will help our uh, customer base. Uh, manage their cash flow. It also helps us manage our cash flow. So you can pay uh, monthly, quarterly, or yearly. You can still pay it yearly if you so desire. And uh, in the week or so that the bills have been out, we've had many, many people pay the entire year, and that's fine. Uh, but it gives you a chance to manage your cash flow, uh, pay the twenty-four fifty a month or the seventy-three fifty per quarter. Um, as long as it's paid by the end of the quarter, you're current and you're in good standing and everything will be fine. Um, I, think, um, I think it's long overdue for the customers to manage their cash flow and for us to manage ours. I mean, that's what everybody expects, isn't it? That's, well, that's what they expect you to do. Well, you know, they're, look, I'm like everybody else. I mean, have I overlooked bills? Everybody's done that before. You know, you put it back in a you know, where you put your bills and you may overlook it. What's a few days late? That can happen. Or a bill doesn't get to you in the mail or whatever. If you have a bill and you're only getting one bill a year, it's easy to overlook that. You know, some people may not be able to pay the full amount. And, you know, then they forget it and it ends up on their property taxes with penalties and interest. We're trying to help people avoid that. So you have different options, monthly, quarterly, annually. Whichever one best suits your, you know, people on a fixed income, it may be easier on them to pay monthly. Mm -hmm. uh, other folks, it may be easier just to write the check, get it over with, and not have to worry about it. Uh, so we thought that with the, the quarterly billing, uh, it would be, uh, it's actually more fair to me to the customer to do it that way. I think so. It makes a lot of sense. And again, if you only get one small card bill in the mail every year, very easy to see how somebody overlooks it. And, and people need to realize these garbage bills, uh, if you don't pay them by the end of the year, they will end up on your property taxes. And, uh, you know, most people would prefer to avoid that. I mean, property taxes are high. Uh, we're trying to keep those down. Uh, we're trying to keep the solid waste bills down. But it helps us to run the system if people are uh, conscientious enough to make sure that they're paying their solid waste bills. We also have uh, the ability for them to go to um, www.trashbilling.com and pay online. That's and, nice. Uh, it, it, it's very convenient. Uh, it saves phone calls. It saves mailing. Uh, there is a small fee, uh, but we've seen a big increase in people going online and paying. And that may be a generational change. I, I don't know. Uh, but that's out there and available also. And we have auto pay. And we do ask at this time that for auto pay, where, where the money would be taken out of your account on a monthly basis, uh, that you call us to get set up for that at this time. 
And, um, you know, with all those features, it's easy. There, there's a there's a way for you to pay your bill. Hard to find an excuse not to pay it that's when you got right. that many options. So that's, that's right. trashbilling.com. www.trashbilling.com. Perfect. Gentlemen, I think you've illustrated that while there are a lot of challenges, no question, you've said we came in and found a lot of challenges, you're chipping away at them. And you can't, you know, you can't... Um, What's the old thing? How do you eat a, an elephant one little bite at a time? So you can't do it all at once, but you are chipping away. And it's good to know that we are financially stable in Pike County. Yeah, I mean, we, we're not in the position, you know, two years ago, the state was on the verge of taking over county government. And uh, we have corrected a lot of those issues, almost all of the issues that, that caused us to lose our credit rating. And we're trying to reestablish a credit rating. It will be necessary for the county to borrow money, to bond the landfill. We, we can't come up with five million, five and a half million in cash out of the budget in the next three years to expand the landfill. We'll probably have to bond that. And because the county lost its credit rating, the cost to bond will be substantially higher. We'll have to go through most likely the Kentucky Association of Counties bond pool. And a lot of counties have to use that bond pool because they've never had a credit rating. They're small. They don't have a lot of revenue. But, you know, Pike County was not, that wasn't the situation. We had a credit rating. But the folks that were in control didn't find it important to maintain that credit rating. And, you know, if you're in business or you're trying to buy a house, you know, you need to you know, buy a vehicle, your credit score matters. Well, the same thing's true with the county. The county had a credit rating. And we lost it. You know, it's, that's the same as, as basically filing bankruptcy or having zero credit history. Right. And that's going to cost the taxpayers of the county money. It's going to cost people like me money. I'm a taxpayer too. If we had had the credit rating, we would have been able to, to bond the landfill at a lower cost. We're still going to be able to do it, but that's going to be a big outlay. Uh, we are on the right path forward but it's going to be very challenging to maintain, uh, to make sure that we uh, manage our money properly because if we make any big mistakes, we could find ourselves in a bad position. Go back a few years, the county, if you recall, was having to borrow money from community trust to make payroll, to pay the bills, had a line of credit. We've not had to do that. And my goal was to make sure that we can manage our resources from year to year and we're trying to make sure that we do have a surplus at the end of the year, and here's why. We've identified over $16 million in capital needs so far. We're working on a capital plan. And a capital plan is, okay, what do we need? Uh, when do we need it, and what's it gonna cost? And that's everything from a new phone system for the courthouse. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, uh, HVAC issues and other issues at the Hall of Justice that, probably will cost over $100,000 to fix. We have a need for solid waste equipment. We have a need to expand the landfill. We have buildings, fire departments, senior citizens buildings that are going to need roofs, that are going to need HVAC work. We need new equipment like excavators and trucks in our road department because you can't work on roads without equipment. And for instance, our excavators are 20 years old, Reggie. Right? Yes. Yeah. And they're Hyundai's. And, yeah, and we're having to buy parts. We have one that was down. Uh, we just got it back on the on the uh, in, in service. It was down since May. We had to get the parts from South Korea. Uh, they don't sell them here any longer. And you know that was you know instead of getting Caterpillar or John Deere or something that's you know that, that's you know that we can get equipment or parts for, they bought a, a series of excavators that we have to get parts from South Korea for. Those need to be replaced. Uh, we've got dump trucks. We've got uh, pickup trucks that are worn out. All those things are necessary. We can't work on roads without equipment. You can't pick up garbage without garbage trucks. It's just, that's what I keep telling people. So our capital plan is not quite finished. It's getting close. Sixteen and a half million, roughly. Yes. Sixteen and a half million dollars. Including in the needs, landfill. Including the landfill in needs. And that's nothing luxury, okay? I mean, that doesn't count in any new vehicles. Because let's say... None of our employees have taken on vehicles. I don't drive a county vehicle. Reggie doesn't drive a county vehicle. We have cut everywhere we can, but the 
bare bones needs for the county about sixteen and a half million dollars. So it's going to be important for us to try to set some money back to try to address those needs. You can't just spend every penny you have and then say, okay, well, now where we get money for equipment. Because the main function that we have with county government is our roads. That's the number one statutory. You know, pass a budget, take care of the roads, solid waste. Those are the three big ones. Then, of course, we help our fire departments, senior citizens. Uh, we can't do that without money. And we're trying to save money, put money back to address those issues. So you plan to end the year with a surplus? We ended last year with a surplus. We hope that that surplus will be larger this year. But, you know, it's a sort of a false sense of security. We're trying to uh, establish a reserve account to where if, let's say, that uh, next, next quarter that coal severance completely bottoms out or mineral severance bottoms out, that we're not in a position where we're having to worry about laying people off making uh, you know drastic reductions that affect our ability to take care of the roads or pick the garbage up. So, you know, it's just like I said, it's just like running a business. You need, you need to set some money aside. You need to set some money aside from your household. You never know what comes up. And uh, we're trying to do that. Well, I think talking about what you anticipate for the end of the year is a great way to kick off the start of this new year. So you, you've given us some great information and some really positive things to look forward to as Pike County proceeds into 2020. Anything it, it, else, guys? Well, we're going to be talking, we'll probably do another program in a couple of weeks to talk about the census and how important it is. Uh, we'll have another court meeting on February 4th. That'll be the first meeting at 530. Big agenda. We've got a copy of it here. It's going to be a long meeting. Uh, we've got a lot of things, positive things to talk about. And, uh, of course, that program will be broadcast on Pike TV. And then when we do the next program, we can do an update after that meeting. Well, let's just end by reminding everybody the census workers are getting started soon, and it is imperative that everybody answers the census. It is important because government resources are allocated in large part based on population. So count everybody. Count everybody. Count early and often. You can count them twice if we can. <laughs> That's right. right. Thanks again. I think that is going to wrap it up. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again soon with another Pike County Judge Executive Report.